My name is Fernando Florido and I am a GP in the United Kingdom. Now, Mr. Johnson is 78 and has type 2 diabetes. His diabetes control is reasonable on metformin 500mg PD with an HbA1c of 7.1% or 54 millimoles per mole, but he has just developed stable angina. How should his diabetic treatment change? We have covered the 22 NICE diabetes management update in previous videos, but perhaps we need a quick reminder? With information overload, sometimes what we need is a short and concise revision to refresh our memory. And this is what we're going to do today, because in this video I am going to go through the flowcharts produced by NICE in respect of the blood glucose management in type 2 diabetes. The full guideline has 59 pages in the PDF format and NICE has produced a six-page summary on the blood glucose management. This video is going to focus on the two flowcharts that will advise how to choose first-line medicines and how to choose medicines for further treatment. I will put in the description below a link to download the full NICE guideline as well as the six-page summary. There is a podcast version of this episode and other NICE guidance. A link to access the podcast can be found in the video description. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Now this is the first chart that we're going to look at. It doesn't look too terrible. And basically this is the one that's going to help us how to choose first-line medicines. Now before we start, there's a little box here that tells us about rescue therapy and it reminds us that for patients with symptomatic hyperglycemia, we will consider insulin or a sulfonylurea and then review the treatment when the blood glucose control has been achieved. Now the first thing we're going to do is we're going to assess the HbA1c, the cardiovascular risk and kidney function. And as you know, to calculate the cardiovascular risk with a key risk tool, tool or similar, we will normally need to know the patient's age, sex, smoking status, blood pressure and the total cholesterol HDL ratio. Now, once we've done this thing, before we go into the full pathway, there's a little box here. It tells us that for information on using SGLT2 inhibitors for people with type 2 diabetes and CKD, the specific guidance that is not on this flowchart and we will have to refer to that section of the guideline. But otherwise, after we do our initial assessment, we will have three categories. It could be that the patient is not at high cardiovascular risk, or that the patient has got chronic heart failure or established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or the patient has high risk of cardiovascular disease, which is defined as a Q-risk 2 of 10% or higher over 10 years or an elevated lifetime risk. Now the first pathway would be when the patient is not at high risk of cardiovascular disease and for these patients we will offer metformin or if there are gastrointestinal side effects we will give metformin slow release. Now if metformin is contraindicated we will consider one of the other agents, either a DPP-4 inhibitor, a pyoglitazone, or a sulfonylurea, although it does tell us that an SGLT2 inhibitor can be given as monotherapy for some patients, and uh, there's some guidance for those uh, four drugs there. But basically, the summary of that technology appraisal is that NICE recommends an SGLT2 inhibitor as monotherapy in people who can't take metformin, for whom the diabetic control is poor, and only if a DDP4 inhibitor would otherwise be prescribed and a sulfonylurea or pyoglitazone is not appropriate. So it's fairly restrictive. There's a little note here saying that using articlophosin to reduce cardiovascular risk when the blood glucose is well controlled was an off-label and the separate guidance on that. Now the second pathway would be when the patient has got chronic heart failure or established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. 
and it's going to tell us in this box down here what they actually mean by established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and it's fairly intuitive it includes CHD, acute coronary syndrome, previous MI, stable angina, prior coronary or other revascularization, cerebrovascular disease which includes both ischemic stroke and TIAs and peripheral arterial disease. So for those patients we will do very similar, we will start with metformin or if there are gastrointestinal side effects we will give metformin slow release and then as soon as metformin tolerability is confirmed we will offer an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven cardiovascular benefit and this is because obviously SGLT2 inhibitors have now been found to reduce cardiovascular events uh, in patients. Now if metformin is contraindicated then we will give an SGLT2 inhibitor alone. It's fairly straightforward. Now, if the patient hasn't got cardiovascular disease but is at high risk of it, um, it's basically fairly similar. We will give metformin, or if there are side effects, metformin slow release. And then as soon as metformin tolerability is confirmed, we will consider an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven cardiovascular benefit. And Equally, if metformin is contraindicated, we will consider an SGLT2 inhibitor alone. So you may ask, what's the difference between those two? And it's basically that if the patient has got cardiovascular disease or heart failure, we will definitely offer an SGLT2 inhibitor. Whereas if the patient is only at high risk of cardiovascular disease, we will consider it. But in practice, you'll probably find that the pathways are exactly the same because you're going to consider it seriously and you're going to give it unless there's some major contraindication or other consideration. Now, there's a little box here that it reminds us that always start metformin alone to assess tolerability before adding an SGLT2 inhibitor. So metformin is always a start. Now, after we've done this, if the person's HbA1c is not controlled below the target or the person develops cardiovascular disease or a high risk of cardiovascular disease, then we will move to the second flowchart, which is the one about treatment options if further interventions are needed. And here we have it. This is our second flowchart. And if we look at it, it's the one that's going to help us how to choose medicines for further treatment. There's another little reminder there again about rescue therapy and using insulin or sulfonylurea for symptomatic hyperglycemia. And then if treatment options are needed, it will be because at either at any point the HbA1c is not controlled or at any point the cardiovascular risk or cardiovascular status change. Now we're going to start with a cardiovascular risk or cardiovascular status change. And we've got two options. The first one is the person has or develops chronic heart failure or established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And here we've got another box that reminds us exactly what established cardiovascular disease is. And for these patients, we will basically switch or add treatments to make sure that we offer an SGLT2 inhibitor if this is not already prescribed. So if the person develops the condition, we will either add an SGLT2 inhibitor if the HbA1c could do with lowering further, or if the HbA1c is already low and we don't want to lower it anymore, then we will switch one of the existing drugs for an SGLT2 inhibitor. Now the next pathway is if the person has or develops a high risk of cardiovascular disease, then we will consider the SGLT2 inhibitor when switching or adding treatments. So like before in the previous one, um, is slightly more imperative when the person has developed cardiovascular disease 
whereas when the person is a high risk, we will consider it. But again, in practice, it may not make much difference. Now, if at any point the HbA1c is not well controlled, basically it's worthwhile going to this little box down here that tells us that we will switch or add treatments from different drug classes up to triple therapy or dual therapy if metformin is contraindicated. So basically, we will consider any combination to dual or triple therapy of these agents, either a DPP4 inhibitor, pioglutazone, sulfonylurea, but it does tell us that SGLT2 inhibitors may also be an option both in dual therapy or triple therapy. And obviously there are separate guidance for each one of those drugs. Now you may ask, when do you do insulin? But here we have it, when dual therapy has not continued to control the HbA1c, we will consider insulin-based therapy with or without other drugs. And there is guidance on how to use insulin with SGLT2 inhibitors there. So basically, if the patient gets up to dual therapy and they're not well controlled, you may consider triple therapy if the patient is on metformin or just consider insulin as the next step. So what's happening to GLP-1 mimetics? Well, this is where NICE has been quite restrictive in their approach. If triple therapy with metformin and two other oral drugs is not enough, we will consider triple therapy by switching one drug for a GLP-1 mimetic, but only for people who have a BMI of 35 or higher and specific psychological or other medical problems associated with obesity although it does say that you can adjust the BMI to lower for people from black, Asian and other minority ethnic groups. This is because these groups are at higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Or we can give it if the patient has a BMI lower than 35 and for whom insulin therapy would have a significant occupational implication or weight loss would benefit other significant obesity related comorbidities. So we finish our second flowchart. We have come to the end of this video. If you have found it useful, please make sure that you hit the like and subscribe buttons. There's also a podcast version in the Diabetes in Primary Care podcast and the Clinical Guidelines in Primary Care podcast. I will leave a link to the podcasts in the description below. Thank you for watching and I hope that you will join me in the next one. Goodbye.